Welcome to Culture Before Content. Culture Before Content, from Music for All and presented by Yamaha. And now, here's your host, David Duarte. Hey, welcome to the show. My name is David Duarte, and I'm your host here on Culture Before Content. So first, I just wanted to start off with what Music for All's mission is. Their mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through music. And that's for everyone, not only for students, but teachers too. So I hope this podcast and the great content on the Music for All podcast network helps support this mission. So welcome to the show. Um, this platform extends beyond students to embrace educators, foster a community united in its passion for musical excellence. We want to provide diverse stories and innovative techniques to support and amplify the Music for All ethos. And today's show, I'm sure, is going to do that. Our network of voices includes influential educators and those who impact our band programs. It is designed to inspire, educate, connect us all. And through that connection, we can be stronger. So today's episode is pre-recorded, and we're thrilled about the prospect of hosting, hosting live uh, episodes in the future. So today's focus is on student leadership. Uh, we're going to explore student leadership and its impact on the culture of our own classroom. Um, some of the things that I know about student leadership is that it really helps to guide the focus so that the band director isn't doing all the work. It can make your program very successful and very vibrant, and it can go in any area of music that you teach. So in my own versions of uh, student leadership, the gentleman we're going to bring on today was very impactful on that for me. Um, I really think that it helped change and transform who I am as an educator. Um, and now I'm looking back, I still have things today. And this is 30 years into the, you know, 30 years ago, I have made many of these changes and I'm still using them all to this day. So um, the role of student leadership I think can play a vibrant and extremely exciting way to help your classroom um, be a better place to be. Not, you know, we always think about maybe the notes and the rhythms is what makes it successful and the music that we bring. But I think sometimes we need to focus on some of the things in our, in our classroom that the students can do, the students can own, and we can make that culture. So it becomes the expectation. So student leadership, is really one of those things that has made an impact. And I think it really is one of the things that you can spend a lot of time on. So I want to briefly mention that you can expect uh, more uh, segments on this in the future and that we're just going to use today to start, start, the, the, start the conversation on leadership. So I want to encourage you to reflect on your own experiences as you're listening today. And as we get to those live segments, hopefully in the future, um, that we can be a little bit more interactive and maybe bring some of those questions to us in the future. So I'm inviting you to share your stories and let's start that community of learning. So without any further ado, let's bring to the, the show our guest today, Mr. Scott Lang from Scott Lang Leadership. Hey, what's going on, Dave? Congratulations. Hey, Congratulations on the podcast, man. That's really awesome. I'm super proud of you and super happy for you. Oh my gosh. Thank you so I'm much. I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little concerned. Um, I don't know who's coming on because you said influential people that know things, and I can't wait to meet that person. I'm not sure who the other guest is, but I'm just <laughs> glad I could be here and be a part of it because you know, I it, I mean, if it's like your first or second podcast and you're already down to me. Like literally, I mean, you dropped like 78 rungs for podcast <laughs> two. Cause the only person that's going to hear this podcast is my mother, my golden retriever, and neither one cares. Let's just, that's not true. My mom's no, it's listen too. That's, that's oh, not I, true. Well, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited uh, for your new podcast and your new venture. And I'm, I'm happy that I can be a part of the process. So let's and just go in. Well, just to inform my audience, we do have a relationship that goes back 30 years. So, you know, our interaction it's probably a little different than, than some of the guests I have on in the future, but I wanted to bring you on today. I mean, I begged you to come on today because I want the world to know who Scott Lang is, because if you've, the impact that you've had on me personally is I am forever in your debt. So, well, we'll you're, you're too kind. You're too, you're too you know, kind. Just, I've been lucky. I've been surrounded by great people who handed me great opportunities and I was able to do some mediocre things with it. And so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I feel very fortunate and blessed. Yeah, yeah, I beg to differ on that one. So without any further ado, because <laughs> we got a lot of ado going on today, um, I would love to like to start with, let's go with where you went to high school, where you went to college. Oh, you and I both know and nobody cares. Bottom line is Dave taught at the high school that I went to. And let's be clear, I was a mediocre student. I was a mediocre uh, music student. Music theory nearly broke me. And I mean, as a human being, it sucked the soul right well, out of me nearly broke me 
what instrument did you play? I hit some drums every once in a while. I don't know that anybody would confuse what I did with music, but I will tell you, you know, and for the people listening, because assuming they're music educators, and if they're not, you're just weird if you're here. That's just not normal. You know, the thing is, I believe that that experience, that getting a music degree, it, it truly, we, if you can get a music degree, I think you're better at everything you do for the rest of your life. I think you're a better human being. I think you're a better person. I think you're a better father, a better mother, a better partner. I think you're a better business owner. Being, because the thing is, here's the thing, we, we did everything we could, Dave, in, in music school. And people are like, being a, being a music teacher is hard. I'm like, well, yeah. Like, think about college. We tried to weed you out. Everyone else took three classes every day, and you took 17. <laughs> Everyone else had three credit hours, and yours were worth one. Every other class met every other day. Yours met five days a week. Every other one had 124 hours to graduate. You had a 142 hours, and it was <laughs> every day one credit for one class. Like, if you didn't figure it out to get to this point, you just weren't paying attention. But, but it was fun. That's why I did it. You and I have a very different definition of fun. Being this in a practice true. room is not fun. Okay, it is. I, I beg to differ. <laughs> that's why. That's why you have a podcast and I don't. Whatever. So anyway, what high school did you attend, Scott? I went, to, I went to Arcadia High School. At least that's what the diploma says. Nobody remembers me there, and nobody cares. Let's be honest. That's not true. It is and true, where... and that's here's the thing. That's okay. Like the thing is, that's the school's job is to produce people to go on to do things so that that is forgettable. When people talk about like high school, the best years of my life, that may be the saddest statement I've ever heard <laughs> in my entire life. If being 17, trying to figure the world out are the best days of your life, your life took a severely downward spiral after graduation. Well, then what made you go to college to be a music major? Because I wanted the best years of my life ahead of me. And I believed that was the pathway to getting to that point. And I still believe in retrospect that it was the pathway to the best years of my life, not just in the past, but the best years of my life moving forward. Because, you know, the, 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 I call it the genre. The room may change, but I will be in music education to the day I die. And maybe it's on a podcast. Maybe it's in a physical building. Maybe it's with a conductor's baton. Maybe it's talking about leadership of the whiteboard. But the bottom line is the best days of my life are music music education. People don't understand, like, for the rest of the world, our worst day, our worst day conducting is better than most people's best day ever. It oh, really I is. I always tell everyone in the office, I have the best job, and you also be a little envious of what I get to do, because I believe that that statement nails it. Yeah, and so it doesn't let's... mean the job's easy. I want to be clear about that. To, no. to say you have <laughs> the best job doesn't mean you have the easiest job. It means that you have the most valuable job. It's so where did you go to college? Arizona State five, University. Go all of five miles from your high school. Yeah, no, no. For those, I, I went to the University of Arizona. So somehow this became a battle that I didn't even know about. All right. So moving on from college. Well, let's talk about college. The, did you kind of find what we're about to talk about? Your leadership, no. um, your your um, band directing. Did any of your experience come from college other no. than the inspiration to keep going with music? So. No, you know, the, 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 to me, the light switch in college. And and I, I think and I hope and that's what this is about is making this valuable for your listeners. The light, the light bulb in college is is what I said. It either weeds you out or it turns on the light bulb of work ethic. Those are the two things college does. That if you're not able to find that light switch and flip it on and find a serious level of work ethic and dedication, then it'll weed you out of music education. That's the purpose of, of maybe any college education is to weed out those who won't be successful in that endeavor. I like to call them sight singing tests, but whatever. Um, let's talk about where you have taught prior to becoming Scott Lang Leadership. You know, the, the important thing is that, you know, I got to practice teaching for 16 years and, you know, where I did it, how I did it, who I did it with. We all have the same story. I mean, that's the truth is. And the thing is, you know, and I'm growing really I'm growing really focused on this. I want you to think about this, Dave, and then I want your opinion. Like our profession, our profession is one that values performance. Right. I mean, that's what it's about. And the profession of education is about growth. And and ostensibly, you should be able to achieve growth and performance. That's the goal. But when you look at this profession, and it's something I'm really becoming hyper focused on, I'm really becoming hyper focused on, especially in the last six months to a year, is how do we find ways to celebrate and honor those who who have growth but don't achieve performance? Well, you know, and let, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I was gonna well, say, here, you, oh, look at us go. 
You Here's go. the thing, I, and I want to be—I want to be really honest about this, and because I think it's important to be to be to give the people who don't have a voice a voice. So, if, if, follow me with this: How do we honor? How do we honor the music teacher who's teaching K twelve in a rural community in Iowa, and he's driving the bus? He's never going to be—he's never going to have the recordings to be in an honor group. He's never going to play at a state convention. He's never going to be honored as a, a teacher of note. He may never be an NCBT board certified teacher. He may never perform at a national convention. How do we honor? And let's be clear: that's sixty five percent of America. How do we honor the elementary school teacher who will never have a recording, who will never have a performance in note? How do we? We honor the people, 60% of America, who, you know, how do you go? How do you go to your state convention? How do you go to a national event and look at rows and rows of instruments that you'll never be able to afford, of literature that your group will never be able to play? How do you, and, you know, to, to be very pointed to it, because I think this is important to a young teacher and to a teacher who's in this community. You know, it, it's so, I, I see both sides, but how do you look at teacher in the eye and say, well, you need, your horn player needs to play with characteristic sound. And my answer is, I don't have a horn player. What do you mean? <laughs> like, how do we, how do we honor those people who are doing incredible work? Because if you believe, let me ask you this question, Dave, you ready? Let's interview Dave. Yep, Let's I'm turn ready. this culture uh -oh. before content with Scott uh -oh. Lang interviewing Dave Duarte. All right, Dave, do you believe that money impacts uh, music education. Yes or no? Yes, I do. Okay. Then why don't we have a, a rubric when we evaluate groups that, uh, that gives a bump or a, 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 a multiple to groups who are from low economic areas, underrepresented communities or title one schools. Why don't we do that? Well, you're hitting the nail on the head. So I've, oh, I'm not done. To, uh... I'm not done. Mr. Duarte, do you believe, do you believe that music education is about growth? I do. And by the way, I got this idea from you. So be uh, ready. Why don't we have a contest at the first day of school and a contest at the last day of school and the group with the greatest point differential becomes the state champion. You did that well, at Deer Valley. I did do that at Deer Valley. So talk to me about that. Well, it's what my belief was because I think you've kind of hit my passion on the head. Where do I teach? I teach at a, it's, I don't teach at a small school. I teach at a smaller school. And then you know that my passion is bringing out the best of kids. I don't want to teach at those, those programs that are already established. Uh, being a professional musician is fun, but I think we need to share that with everyone and find places where that goes. And it, the idea for that, Scott Lang, came because I felt like people needed to, it came from the comment from judging. Here's hoping my comments have been helpful. And for those of you who know me know that comment resonates with me like none other because why are we hoping that they're helpful? Why are we not finding out ways to make them helpful? Because if we improve and focus on the improvement, it's going to make an impact. I don't care if your band has five people or it has 500 people in your program. And so I, when I started that contest that you mentioned, um, didn't know that I was coming up today, it was really built on the growth model and finding ways to get the resources when when you identify who's you know, the, low, the lower scoring groups. It's not necessarily means it's a bad thing. It just means that might be the only thing we can produce with those resources and guess what happened when we started doing that able to channel resources to those schools and guess what happened to most of those schools they, they floated yeah and they floated some of them floated to the very top in that district so okay so um, let me ask you another question you ready do you believe that music is for every child yes or no yes i do okay. believe and i also think that music okay. should be kind of required of every child well, we agree on that. You're, you're preaching to the choir on that, despite it being a band show. But here's the question then. Then why don't we have a rubric involved, which involves retention? I don't know. And you know that I spent my life, <laughs> my life, that's what I, for those of you who don't know, I used to be a music administrator for 11 years. And the very first task that was, I don't think you know this, Scott, the very first task that handed to me was uh, numbers in the programs. And it, was, it wasn't just band at the time, but at the time, I think there was only like 12% of the kids were in band. Well, I started focusing on the numbers and just handing it off to principals. Lo and behold, what did I learn? Principals don't do not like to be the last on a list and they love to be first. So I started using enrollment as a as a report that would go out to schools to see what we could do. And it and again, it 
it found its way. And that enrollment numbers, when I left that district, we were hovering between 25 and 30 percent at the last for the last few years of kids enrolled in band. And, and you know, there were programs that even had up to 60, 70 percent of the kids in band. And that had an impact on growth. It had an impact on the middle schools. It had an impact on the high schools. But again, kind of unfair when you have access to a K-12 group on your own. Um, so, yeah, it, I do believe what in what you say. So the thing is, and, and listen, I'm not casting any aspersions. I want to circle back to, to where I started, which was how do we honor the teachers and people who are voiceless in this profession? How so do we I, honor people who will never have? Because we can talk in hyperbole all day long about inclusivity and diversity and equity. But how do you how do you get, you know, because we all know. If, if we can be honest, we all know that the reason most people become music teachers is because they had influential music experience. Fair point, Dave? Fair point. Okay. I, I Go ahead. So if we, if we believe that, if we believe that and we want, we want experiences, we want educators to represent diversity, inclusivity, and equity, which we all do, then how do we get great teachers to teach in the South side of Chicago? Well, we, it starts by first off creating a culture of us as music educators. And again, part of what this show and why I said yes to doing it is because I believe in that. Um, you know, I have taught in the inner city. I have taught, I have taught, taught everywhere. And when I was handed musical groups that were great, it was fun and all, but there was something in my heart that said, this is not where I belong. I belong trying to find those programs. Wait, you will okay. wait. I'm sorry. And that, and so what that has become is my challenge. So I want to, I want to back piggyback onto your last question to move this question forward. So I have started, I have moved to the Pacific Northwest. The weather's great. I love it here. Um, but I have started talking to the band directors who, who share, I mean, I'm actually in a group with the small band directors here. And I will tell you, I have, Dave, you're not really small, your average size. Don't put yourself down like that. I'm sitting on a chair. So <laughs> my point is I've been hanging around with band directors who teach are literally like the music of the community, of their area. And these people are some of the greatest teachers I have met. And you're right, their performance is not gonna, may not be putting them on this aspect of like, hey, let's be on the stage at, at, at Music For All. It's just not gonna happen for those programs. Cause I mean, what do you do when you have 11 kids in your band program? But I'm telling you, there is so much out there, it, but we, the community have to go out and find it. And we, the state music education, Hold on, I'm still not done, Mr. Lang. We, the state music ed educators, need to start realizing that we need to be carrying, comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Otherwise, the apples are going to keep getting all of the attention. When we oranges, we just want to make juice. That may be the most bizarre analogy I've Whatever. ever heard it's what about I, orange juice. No, it's brilliant. So, But here's my point. That's exactly my point is we don't honor growth. We, we do honor not. achievement as a profession. And I'm, don't, I'm not absolving myself of this, but we have to understand that we are not a profession of achievement alone. We are a profession of achievement and growth. And I, I respect and, and I stand in awe of, of the people who can achieve things at, at a performance level that are just incredible. And I don't want to take one scintilla of credit for their work, their effort, their knowledge, and their skills. But I also, to the other hand, I don't want to ignore the people who are achieving great things, but will never have that level of performance. Cause I believe it's about growth as much as it is about performance. And I think that's the further conversation we all need to have. And I think, I think what it needs is we just, again, we, it's kind of like we need to be a grassroots community. If, I mean, I believe in everything that you say. And like I said, I'm living it right now. I am stuck in a growth model. You know, I started the program I took over after COVID was, you know, not in a healthy place. And here I am two years later, year number three, and I can see where the, where the pieces are falling. And I, you know, I, I'm learning how to put this particular program together. And again, it's not about me, but I am living the growth model as we speak. I have to celebrate. I have to kind of ignore what the world has to say about how my band performs. And yeah, we'll do the, we'll get the ratings at the festivals because I'm smart enough to know how to do that. But in the truth is I'm wanting my kids to grow one by one. And every time we go out, it's better. But so, okay. So think about this just as a paradigm shift. If, if we, if we were to shift that paradigm, of not, and I believe, so I look at this as a Venn diagram 
And when you consider life-changing experiences, it, there's a Venn diagram, there's a circle of performance excellence, and there's a, perfor a, a circle of student experience, okay? And so where those two circles intersect, that's where culture is. You know, people can talk about culture. Well, I've got a great culture in my program, but I do believe part of culture is setting standards of excellence and not, you know, that, that you can't just, just talk about the warm fuzzies of we're good people and we're nice people because we're paid to be music educators. That is why we got a paycheck. And so we should be setting standards. We should be setting, um, having structure. We should have scope, sequence. There should be rigor to our curriculum and to what we're doing. We absolutely should. I not, and I believe that you saw, Dave, when I was a teacher, I had standards and, and rigor oh. and excellence. But <laughs> yes, but no. <laughs> if you've only got standard rigors, a rigorous uh, curriculum and excellence, and you're not utilizing culture, first of all, you're never ever going to get to the highest potential that that student can achieve. But bottom line is, what good is that literature? What good is that experience? What good is that performance when that student's my age? And the answer is it's nothing. It's worth nothing. That what we take in 93% of students, and by the way, the number is getting better. 93% of students will leave high school and not play their instruments again. Well, if we're only teaching F sharps and bis fingerings and B flats, then we're failing 93% of our students. 93%. And well, so go ahead. That's, that's what we're here to talk about. But so again, I'm not, I'm not discounting the rigor, the excellence. I'm not discounting the, the culture and the standards. I'm saying the true music education experience lies in the center of that Venn diagram. And I would love to keep exploring how to get there because again, I will, I will flat out say, I think we need to kind of redefine from top to bottom, from large program to small program, from rich program to poor program. Poor is probably a bad word to say, but it's not poor. Probably, I understand. You know. So think yeah, about and, this. Okay, Dave, here you go. Culture, it, you know, and, and let's be fair. And again, I just, my job, I've always said, my job is to poke. It's to get, I don't have any answers, but I got a lot of questions I want to ask. You know, the thing is culture. Culture requires diversity. That is the essence of it, you know? And so if you look at it, can you truly have a culture of a wind ensemble that's made up of all Allstate players? Can you truly have a culture if it's uh, um, a jazz ensemble where they all improv at level five? Can you? Well, I, I'll turn that around on you. How can it not? It's, how hard is it to be, produce results when you have all state players? How hard is it to do Midwest when you have students who all take private lessons? How hard growth, is it really? Come back to the question we started on. I'm going growth. On and achievement. We are extraordinarily good at, and it's, it's natural to this business. We're no different than sports. You know, we have champions. It's first place. It's state champions. It's highest point totals. Like, like that is, you can't, you can't discount that and you can't remove it. I, and I would never want to, that's part of the experience. But the bottom line is that rubric only measures one thing and it's performance. How do we build? And no, let me rephrase that. We have to build a rubric that measures growth. So imagine, imagine pick, I, I don't want to say, uh, I don't want to use an event because I don't want to pick on air organization. <laughs> pick, an, pick an honor event, pick an honor festival, pick an honor group, whatever it is. Let, let's make one up. The National um, Honor Wind Band of America. It's a mythical group, okay? National Honor Wind Band. It's pretty exciting stuff, isn't it, Dave? I'm announcing it here live on your show. What if... What if we brought in 10 teachers and they each got 20 minutes to teach the group and the person who made the group the best in 20 minutes got to be the group's conductor? Didn't matter where Amazing. they came from. Like that would measure growth. That would not measure performance. But we take the name, the, the, the person, I mean, you know, the person who, co who taught at the university, who only had graduate students in their ensemble and time to do scholarly study. And again, I don't want to come off as snarky. I don't want to, I don't want to critique that. That is a brilliance that I don't have. And I respect that. And I don't want to diminish it. But what I want to say is, hey, hey, guys, there's 60% of America that will never, who might be 10 times the teacher, but will never no. Well, then I have a question for you, Scott Lang. And we haven't yeah. even got to your bio. We're going to get to the because, top of the show. No, kids. we're, we're gonna not going to. No, point. we're not going to my bio because nobody cares. What's your question? I Dave? Lay it on me. Lay it okay. on me. So building a culture of a network of like-minded individuals, I think is important. I am trying my best 
this is again, kind of like just sharing. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just sharing, but I have been doing my darndest to start meeting people in my area. And, and the people I'm really most in wanting to meet are the people who are like-minded. And so have programs that look like mine that have, so that we can compare, Hey, how did you get a kid to learn the French horn? Hey, I noticed you have a bassoon player. What kind of resources do you have? Hey, what does your district do? Or like, you know, where I, I teach in a one city, one high school you know all the schools are are where i teach and so i have a new perspective on how this works now but I, i'm kind of surrounded by that same type of like-mindedness here and so what i'm having to learn you know 34 years into the game of music education here i'm having to start over to learn that culture so that i and yeah i've made mistakes but i'm i'm preaching more successes at this point to my own brain because with every mistake i come back at it and it's again i've got my own growth model for my own self you know people don't know my, my wind ensemble had a clarinet and a trombone after covid and now here i am with nine clarinets and four trombones but yeah they're all like 15 years old because i'm having to rebuild from the youth to make it happen and so when the band performs as i tell my students i, I hope they don't talk to you because you guys act like you're 12 but when you play, you sound amazing. And I'm trying, and again, part of that is it was, was finding that culture to bring the kids into the program. Again, um, I have some just amazing feeder schools and I wouldn't have it without that. And that's a whole nother conversation for a whole nother show about the system from bottom to top in an area and how you can, how you can help assess that. So, um, so okay. Let me answer those. Uh, let me, let me speak to that for just a second. So a couple things, number one, um, I've always, my mother once told me when I was a young kid, uh, she said, you can go anywhere, anytime you want and do whatever you want. As long as when you're confronted, met, caught, you speak with respect. And her point was it, that if you see an open door, if you see a person you want to meet, go meet them. And if they say, I don't have time right now, say, I'm sorry to interrupt your day and walk away with respect. And I say that because that really spoke to me. In my first time at Midwest, I took that mentality. And I met Alfred Reed. I met Frederick Fennell. I met Harry Beejan. I met Frank Batista. And so the first thing I would say is in this world of social media, the, the easier it is to connect, the less we really connect. And I'm not speaking any profound moments here, but the bottom line is like, when I would borrow a piece of music from Dave Duarte, my favorite is Bill Richardson. I'd have to drive to his school, <laughs> get the piece of music, see his score markings and go, oh, you doubled this, why? And show me your program notes. And how did you get the oboe in tune? Because the oboe doesn't physically play in tune. And, you know, that that connection is, is what's missing now. And okay. so... Oh, well, let me, let me tag this right in really quick is because you said it really clearly is that all of our professional development events, because they reward performance, only connect performers. How do we put a band up there and say, okay, and, and you, Dave, here's a good example. Your, your CD is right behind us. For those who don't know, Dave's jazz band played at Midwest and um, very, very fine jazz band. Dave, Dave asked me to conduct, which I was honored to, by the way. But think about this. Do you remember what was the first thing you called me? I was in an airport. It's September 7th. I do remember. Do you, do you remember what I told you to do? You're not going to remember. Do you remember I what I remember. told you? <laughs> I was still in shock moment. It's, it's on the, and by the way, Dave was the first and only group to have a DVD as their concert program. Do you remember what was on that DVD? Oh yeah. All of my notes on how to make the band, all of my mouthpieces, all of my, uh, by the way, the list has not changed very much. What, it was what else is on there? Uh, the beginning recordings of That's it. many of the tunes. I <laughs> told, I told Dave, I want you to record your sight reading of these tunes because the average band director only hears the product and they think it's unattainable. And if they hear your band on September 7th and they hear that it's not good and it's not in tune and the articulation, the phrasing isn't there, they get to see themselves and they get to, in seeing themselves, they seem valued. They see, they are felt heard and they felt empowered to become what you become. But if we only show them the performance in Chicago, we don't value them. They don't feel heard and they don't believe it's possible. That's why I wanted you to record day one so that every band director who can be Dave Duarte, but doesn't believe it, can believe it and feel valued and heard. Every group 
at Midwest should have to release their sight reading recordings. I believe it. Actually, I think those are still up on YouTube if you search for them. Because I actually recorded, I recorded many of those. But again, not about me. But it, it was helpful because you actually came in. Speaking of leadership, you came in and you literally helped redirect me how to get there. Because again, uh, that performance, first off, getting it is very scary when you first get yeah. it. But then you have to realize uh, you have to play there and you were super influential on helping me, the teacher, because again, it talk about growth model. There was some serious growth that had to happen, but I, I, I think this still goes back to you, the teacher, Scott Lang, and how after we met, um, I still remember walking into your band room and you had that huge box and kids were just top, tossing by the way for those of you under the age of of, of 40 cassette tapes um of each one of his kids um and he Tape made test. every single yes and you and, and i sat i just sat there and i'm like wait you do that and so i guess that goes back to well let's talk about this how does scott how did scott lang build his culture and because your bands and, and i'm going to talk to you about you moment your bands have been to the Rose Bowl. Your bands have done amazing things. I had great theater teachers. That true, but you did it at places that not necessarily would yeah. be expected to this to happen. Again, that goes back to that performance thing. You know what's possible, what's probable, and what's doable. You got there not just because of your great feeders. You got there because you had a culture in your band program that I still am start trying to capture to this day. So How I, did I you get it. Talk it, about it, some of it. Okay, I will. All right. So first of all, thank you. I, uh, we had a funeral. We lost a, a teacher in our in our community, and there was a funeral not too long ago. Uh, I, you may be familiar with who I'm talking about from the university at North. And I went to his wake, and I ran into my percussion teacher who taught with me 30 years ago. And he laughed as we were hoisting a beverage, saluting the teacher that had since gone. He said, I always got to tell you, Scott. And I said, what? He goes, if I ever started a cult, you'd be the first guy I called. So understand a couple things. Number one, culture is short for the word cult. And cult, the definition of culture is a common set of accepted practices, values, and beliefs by a given group of people in a time and place. Now, here's the first part of that. A common set of accepted practices, values, and beliefs. And the thing is, the, the culture the culture comes from the person on the podium. You can say all the words you want. In other words, I could say the culture, the culture of my high school is empathy, patience, and, and understanding. But it would never become the culture because I'm not that person. Like culture follows the person on the podium. And what they see is what they be. That's the bottom line. When they see those things, they be those things. And so when you look at when you look at, at the groups I taught is they were a reflection of me. They were, I, and I don't mean to be, I'm not paying, but I'm a pretty hardworking dude. I'm pretty tenacious. It's pretty hard to keep me down. When you say no, I'm going to go around you till I get a yes. And I don't care who I offend in the process. I'm going to get after every kid every day and I won't stop. That's my personality. And so the kids reflect the person on the podium. And so when you look at yourself as a director, the people who are listening to this, what's important is that you be honest about who you are and embrace it. So let me explain this. Can I have 10 seconds here, Dave? You can have all you want, Scott. Okay. I'm not telling you anything. <laughs> While I'm doing this, I want, you to, I want you to process on this question. Okay, you ready? Who is Dave Duarte? Now, before I'm going to give you a second to answer. I'm going to tell you who Scott Lang is. And this took me a long time to figure this out because I had to get to a place of humility to figure it out because I, I couldn't just talk about who I was. Look at all my good characteristics. I had to be willing to admit who I wasn't. Okay. See if this resonates with the person, you know, Dave Tuarte. Here we go. Scott Lang is a modern music educator who embraces all curricula, jazz marching, curric jazz marching and concert. He imbibes and emboldens student leadership in his curricula from a pace of passion. He likes working with low SES schools, and he is capable of taking your ensemble from zero to 90, but not 90 to 100. I'm not capable of that, Dave. It's not in me. You can't put me in front of uh, a Texas wind ensemble two days before a national performance and say, take it that last 2%. That's not who I am. But understanding that, because I always believe you do the most good when you're doing what you're most good at. Knowing who I was and where I do the most good 
places of low ES that value leadership training, that value work ethic, that will that have zero but want to get to 90. Knowing who I am meant knowing who I wasn't. And to be clear, I will never be when I'm uh, I'm doing a session uh, next week at a, a, a national conference and I can confidently and comfortably say I will never be two doors down conducting on that stage. But let's also be clear, the person conducting on that stage will never teach in East LA and did what I did. That's the thing. If you have to embrace who you are, not just on the podium each and every day, but the community that you serve. Because if you don't, it becomes disingenuous. And let's be clear, I wrote a chapter in a book about you in mm. that exact circumstance, serving a community that didn't reflect who you were. How'd that and, go, Dave? Yeah, I still got some PTSD <laughs> to this day. And I'm kind of, and I, it wasn't you and it wasn't the community. It was you weren't the right fit. And still to this day, those words are in my head every single day. Thanks to you, Scott Lang, because I think you describe me better than I am able to describe myself. So who I gave you, I gave you a minute to think about. I told you who I was. And, and to the t teachers listening, I, I want to tell you that there's no bad answer to this question. The only bad answer is I don't have an answer. Because if you don't have an answer, then you can't find your home. It's just that simple. So I'm going to ask you, Dave, can you tell me who you are? I will try. But okay. David Duarte is a music educator who believes in the power of every child that he comes across. It does not matter whether that child has money or not. It doesn't matter where they live. What matters is I have access to the people who are in front of me. I am most comfortable in front of children who reflect the area of who I believe I represent. I come from a, a very diverse family. I come from a diverse background. Yeah, and I need, and I, I learned the hard way that diversity helped shape me because I didn't realize that my own personal cultural and heritage is important to who I am. And those beliefs of how I br was brought up came out. So as a music okay. educator. Stop there. I heard everything you said and I'm leaning in because I'm loving it. Okay. Now here's my next question, Dave Duarte. Hmm. Where's the rubric that assesses and values that? Where's the event that assesses and values that? Where's the where is the where is the collegium, the honor group, the face? Where's the Facebook group that says really bad bands just trying to get better? There isn't one. And th that's my point. So when we're going back full circle, if we want and believe that if we if we if we believe that music education is not just about performance but it's about growth and if we want diversity equity and inclusivity then we have to see recognize value and honor the people who teach there because we have to be really clear about this question if you say to me scott I'm going to pay you $50,000 a year and you can teach in the suburbs with a strong feeder program with 55 incoming kids, balanced wins, balanced instrumentation and supportive parents and the opportunity to play at X ensemble, X event, X national competition. Or I can pay you the same amount of money to have a band program of 12 where you walk through two metal detectors to get to school. You don't know if anyone's going to show up. There is no feeder program and you will be invisible for the rest of your career. Where would you teach for the same money? You that's, know the answer. Well, that's <laughs> the problem, though. You know, because we said in the beginning, most people become music educators because they have a, a, a successful music experience. Well, if places of diversity, inclusivity, low SES, Title I, if they're not having successful experiences because it's their third band director in two years, then we're not going to move those kids into the matriculation of becoming music educators. But does that not speak to finding out who you are as a person and where yes. you belong? And again, I hate to say this, but money makes a difference, even on it our does. own personal side. How yes. much you're going to work in this state for forty thousand dollars a year, or come to another state where they're paying one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year? It does have an impact. And my old district tried to do that in its own district because my district had low SES and the high and they tried the right. model and they failed. You want to know why they failed in my opinion? I do. 
I do. Because because they didn't change to the culture of the people they were serving. They just brought the people they thought that again, they, they brought the all state level teachers to the school, but they didn't take time to learn the clients that they were serving. And I, I guess I'll get a little administrator here on you. Test scores don't matter. We need to value how to learn first before we value the test. Oh, but in test scores can matter. If you're, if you're measuring growth. So let me give you an example. When I became an administrator, um, which is like taking a hot lead Sorry, poker and jabbing me, your let eye me, Let me, can I, can I think? I would say this per performance scores versus growth scores. I, that's that it was my meaning. Okay. So here's like, so I taught in a district and when I became an administrator, I'm always looking for the positive because I do believe living well is the best revenge. And for my first newsletter, I did a deep dive on our test scores and you know, the district. And I looked at the, the shining, the shining school on the hill. And I looked at them and the kids were coming in in the 84th percentile and our kids were coming in at the 29th percentile at my high school. Mm -hmm. And I started doing some analysis and I found out my kids were coming in the 29th percentile, but they were leaving at the 46th percentile. And the, sky, the Shining School on the Hill, they were coming in at the 84th percentile and leaving at the 82nd percentile. But who did the district call the Shining District School on the Hill? You know, and my point is because I don't mind measuring test scores as long as we're measuring growth and achievement. It's, I'm, not, I'm not advocating measuring achievement. Like mm -hmm. I like to win as much as everybody, but I want to also know that achievement isn't always possible. When you look at me and say, you're, you're, you're in marching band, your alto sax needs to play with more characteristic sound. Well, then he won't be heard because I've got one of them. So do you want to <laughs> be heard with bad sound or not be heard at all? Let's be real. Because again, let's go back to the 60% of teachers who will walk into a conference hall and see literature that they will never play, instruments they can never afford, and then go to a concert and know my group will never sound like that and I will never stand on that podium. And then look at them with a straight face and say, we value and honor you too. We don't. Well, that makes me, I want to educate my audience a little bit here. So Scott Lang was a teacher. What happened after Scott Lang was a teacher? Uh, parents complained. Um, yeah. uh, what did no, you I, do? What did you do, Scott Lang? What did, what job did you attempt to take? Oh, I became an administrator. Yes. And yes. then what did you do? Um, quit really quick. And I took Dave's job to be honest with oh, you. Yeah. I, I a, followed Dave Duarte. I was Dave's backup singer. We, That's we what connected I was. twice. I taught at your high school and then you That's took right. my job. And, and my you arranged gave it to and Dave and Dave um, and Dave arranged uh, my marching band. And when my jazz band played with the Canadian Brass um, for the MENC convention, Dave arranged uh, one of their pieces for jazz ensemble and Canadian Brass, which had never been done before. And the Canadian Brass now have that arrangement in their library. Woo. That I was you. That. that was Dave Duarte. So let's go back to the beginning of the show. So what did Scott do after teaching? I knew I became an administrator and I knew within days I'd made the worst no, mistake. After in my life. Besides that, after you went oh, back to Marcos, then, um, then I went, I went back and taught for four more years and they were four fantastic years following Dave. Um, Dave set me up for success. And then, uh, then I, I became, Start doing leadership stuff, but Dave, look, we're 43 minutes in. We've kind of hit the bumper now. We have, so we did, should, we don't we need to hear about what I did. Let's, let's talk about, let's talk about the word culture again. Okay. okay. So here's, here's what I believe true culture is. And I, here's the thing I like to say, um, do you have a computer in front of you, Dave? I do. I have a, I okay. Have I need you to Google this for me right now. And okay. while, I oh. while I talk to the community, you're going to oh, Google fine. this. I want you to Google the words excellence innovation marching band and tell me how many hits you get go how many okay, hits well, are infinite but i can tell you what the top hits are i no no i want you to give me the number it'll say it'll give you a, a, a number in the search bar at the top i want you to google excellence innovation marching band and hit return and give me the number at the top while you're doing that I, i'm going to talk to the i group. don't see the number i just see i just okay. see the google but I, wow. I, mean, I can tell you what the first word or who the, nope. who, the who they are. Nope. I don't want to know who they are because I don't want to call. Hold on. Or maybe it, maybe it's down uh, a bunch more images. Dear Lord. Okay. This is, this is a long page. <laughs> more results. I don't see the number though. So you're gonna have to Google because maybe I Googled on the wrong Googly place. It's it's like it's it's like twelve thousand one hundred and forty-two. 
Do you believe, Dave, there's 12,142 groups that are truly innovative or excellent? No, I think we use the word. I think we use the word too loosely. <laughs> okay. So now take innovate. The, get, good segue, Dave. Now Ooh. change change that to culture. We use the word too loosely. Yes. And so the thing is, what I believe culture is, it's common sense, accepted practices, values, and beliefs, and, and by giving group people time and place. But true culture, I believe, is about filling the gap. And the, the thing I always say is, if it's on the wall, it's not in the hall. If it's in the hall, it doesn't need to be on the wall. I'm not about slogans. I'm about what are the behavior, the common set of behaviors, a sets of practices, values, and beliefs in a group of people every single day. And so culture for me is about filling the gap. And when I say that, filling the hole, meaning where are you not successful? My kids don't practice. Okay, then culture is about establishing a practice ethic. My kids don't treat each other with respect. So, okay, then our culture is going to be about building respect. That if you're only affirming things kids already have, we're not growing. And so it's about being able to look for the holes in the ensemble and look for the holes in the program and fill them. And it's whack-a-mole. You fill one hole, there's another one's going to pop up. But the bottom line is, are you helping students grow by finding the spaces where they're not? Where they're not. So, wow, I think you hit a little question, a question thought bubble in my head because I do, I do believe like culture, you know, like I, I live off of the culture of, of right. my program. I live and it's not just my band. It's the parents. It's every, it's the football game. It's everything has a culture to it. And I want to make sure that we're a building it, adding to it, making it better. Every single time we go out. Something okay. Do you from- believe Dave? You named off five different groups, a marching band, a, a pep band, a concert band, jazz band, a parent group, right? Fair point. Fair do point. you believe they do you believe they all have different cultures? I do. I do I believe do too. Each, I believe every culture is unique to the spot that you're in, to the time that you're in, to the year to year, to the semester to the semester. And that you can you can what I'm doing like right now is identifying which cultures I don't like. And I'm spending my head my I'm beating myself up trying to change things that take sometimes, you know, let's talk about how we, when you tear a band program down from a, this program had 200 kids and now it has 15, you know, you're not oh, going to get back. To, change the not, director. That's how you do it. Well, that's what change happened the in the first place. That's Usually, what happens but, everywhere. That the, but, the, the greatest threat to music education is the music educator on the podium. I, I believe that too, but I said, you know, I don't think of the culture and as, and as a, as a, as a process or something that I have to do. I think it is something that I have to discover and figure it out. Okay. And it, it goes like this, Scott, it goes up okay, and down, so, but as long as the trajectory is going up, I'm winning the okay. culture game. So in filling the hole in that school that you mentioned, that I taught at, we had three, mm-hmm. three things we said every day and they were discipline before instruction. Behavior before performance. We are better only if, and the kids would say, we work harder. So discipline before, and the kids would scream instruction. Behavior before performance. We are better only if we work harder. You know, the three things those kids liked when I got there was respect, work ethic, and showing up to rehearsal. So I filled the hole. And every band, now that's a program thing, but every band has a different culture. The freshman band culture is not the same as the top wind ensemble. You know, the jazz ensemble. And to the teachers that are listening, that's okay. Like, there should be a place for the kid who's not good. There should be a place for a kid who's going to Juilliard. There should be a place for a kid who's been on his horn six weeks. There's kid, there should be a place for a kid who had six hours of time in a practice room this week. That's okay. By having different cultures and different ensembles, you're allowing students to self-select to a place that will help them grow the most. Self-select. Hundred percent. I gosh, I you. What are we going to argue about something? Come on, I find something we don't agree upon. Can't or well, it's not going to happen. Number one, just I just uh, reflecting while you're talking. I'm what right now. My culture, my own band program, my freshman band has got the best culture I've, I think I've ever had with freshmen. Why? And it's a t- it, why? Because I, I, I think I pre 
I pre-built this set of freshmen based off the mistakes of the other two. Cause again, I am not from this area. So I'm having to learn how to fit inside of where I'm at. So, you know, I, as I say, first round, just make, you know, I, I call it grin and bear it. I just had to grin and bear it until I could figure out who these, who these children were last year. It was good, but it just wasn't, it was a whole, it was again, COVID has made this interesting for all of us. And we all have how COVID made band different story for all of us. Right. And then when the, and this set came in, I will tell you flat out and I'm, I apologize if the way I'm going to phrase this, but this was not the best um, technical group of kids. And it has right. turned out to be one of the best freshman bands I have ever had with 19 kids in it. And they work harder. And it, again, it just kind of went. Okay. So, and, and I would argue, and this took me a long time to figure out, but I argued one day I was in a grumpy mood because I had those days and and I told my top group during rehearsal, I said, you know what? They said, well, you, someone made a kind of joke. You're our, we're your favorite, Mr. Lyon. I said, no, you're not. And they went, what? <laughs> and I said, freshman band's my favorite class to teach. And they're like, well, why? And I said, because they'll do anything I ask without any questions. It if didn't I say, out but I'm saying younger kids tend to be more malleable. And so the freshmen are just so eager to please because it's a new director, a new building, a new experience, and they're more open. And that's, I'm less open at 56 than I was at 46. That's the yeah. way it works. Are you 56? I am. All right. I forgot, I forgot so your sweet. It's time to wrap this up because our listeners uh, well, actually, turn, they turned off the podcast 40 minutes ago. What Let's ever. be honest. When they said, please welcome Scott Lang, they were like, delete. So we're, we're still going to get to question two at some point. I'm kidding. But let me ask you this. I want to, I okay. want to interview you at the end. Okay. Oh, we're, we're, we're coming. I still get final this. thoughts. It is my show. I think. It is your show. Well, it, you, well, it, let me rephrase. It was my show. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Scott Lang. So, okay. <laughs> well, I, I want to ask you um, three questions. Okay. Um, and I'm going to challenge you to answer them in the fewest words humanly possible. So you can take a pause before you answer. Hmm. Why did you start this podcast? Belief asked. Okay. Good answer, by the way. Mm. What, what do you hope that your listeners get from this podcast? Connection, understanding. And what's the one thing you would like every teacher who's listening now to know to believe after having spent time with you and on this podcast? Change is inevitable. Don't accept they, it. There you are, sorry. folks. That's that was culture. The, uh, you, can, you can make your own focus. On, look at your culture. Evaluate culture of your own program. Okay. Move, move Ladies forward. And, this is your new opening with Culture Before Content with your host, Dave Duarte, sponsored by Music for All, who offer a variety of programs, believing that every child can make music. Know what's possible. Know that change is inevitable and believe you can achieve it. Culture okay, Before I get, Content. I get the last thing, Scott Lang, and the reason why I brought, by the way, to my audience who's listening, you need to meet this gentleman. Send him an email. Find a way to get to him. Go to a national conference that he's at and go say hi and tell him you heard him here first because the reason he's here he didn't even talk about it um and that's what he is fabulous people he has made a difference on my life and which is yeah it's tried disappearing and so scott lang leadership is amazing and i am dying to get him up here to where i live to meet my children it will change you forever and i am not i am not paid spokesman um at all. But Scott Lang, can you tell us a little bit, like maybe like a minute clip of Scott Lang leadership and what it I, is before you, bet, you leave today? You bet. If you want to get to, if you want to find me, you want to learn about me, I'm at scottlang.net. Super simple. If you want to help grow your music education program, you want to go to bepartofthemusic.org. That are, those are free recruitment and retention solutions, not just grow your program, but to grow your skill set. And then last but not least, the thing I'm probably most proud of professionally in my life is Music Foundations, which is musicfoundations.com. And that's structured. And that's the key word. Structured SEL and leadership 
into a music education method book. It's structured. Sign, sign up for his emails. I, I read them all the time, except the difference is I, I, I usually sometimes text you my answers, which is not most people can't do, but I do. So, Scott, thank you for coming on the show. My today. pleasure. Thanks thank to everyone who for... tuned in. I appreciate you, Dave. I appreciate well, uh, your Well, also colleagues. thanks to all the people that tuned out as well. Let's, let's yes. be honest. Well, they're gone already, so we don't really and care. I mean, how about another thank you for Music for All for providing this? This, um, and I hope to see everyone here coming up in the future. But thanks everyone for coming. This has been Culture Before Content. I'm David Duarte. That was Scott I'm Lang. Scott Lang, and we are out of here. <laughs>